For all you guys out there who've ordered Corvettes and not getting them, you probably make phone calls saying, where's my car? I'll give you a tip on how to make it easier for you. Don't call them on a smartphone. Smartphones are where kids play video games and stuff. Get a real phone. Like this flip phone I got from Walmart for 20 bucks. Now here's a serious phone. There's nothing but make calls. They know you're serious. And to prove it, I called GM today and I said, I want my Corvette and I want it tomorrow. And it better be blue like I ordered. So let's see what happens. I'm going to go down to the warehouse now. It's been a day. Let's see if they listen and got my car. All right, we're in our garage. Let's see what they delivered or if they delivered anything at all. Yep, here it is. A brand new blue Corvette convertible, just like I ordered. See? It helps when you use the real phone, the flip phone. I've always liked Corvettes in blue. They look best in that color. I think, anyway. I'm sure you've already seen other Corvette videos on YouTube, so I'm not going to cover the entire car in detail. You've probably already seen that. Instead, we're going to cover the good, the bad, and the ugly. A true, honest test, as we always do. Which is why you need to watch my videos instead of theirs. We don't pull any punches here. The first thing we always do when we get a new car is check to see if there's a spare tire, but there's not one on a Corvette. There's no room to put one. And the second thing we do is check out the headlights in the dark and see how they perform, and we'll do that right now. It's dark enough. Let's see what these headlights do. Look pretty bright to me. You have the low beams on a building 100 feet away, very bright, decent height considering the low height of the car. Go to high beam, very bright, looks encouraging. Here's what the rear view camera looks like in the dark. Pretty decent spread. And the numerous climate control buttons are all lit up at night. As I would hope. And we can't do the 300 feet building check because someone's put a barrier on the fence. Oh well. That's how far it goes on low beam anyway. About uh, 180, 200 feet. Here's what the gauge cluster looks like in touring mode. But press the magic button. And it goes to sport, getting a nice light show here. Press it again, and there we got track. Since I wasn't able to do a long distance test with the headlights in the city, it gives me an excuse to come out on the back country roads, do a quickie test out here. Let's give it a roll, shall we? On low beam, these headlights are pretty good. They do disappear in dips a little bit, but not that bad. I can see pretty far ahead, but the brights are really, really nice. Great for backcountry roads like this. You really need a good set of headlights on this winding road because occasionally mountain lions come out and you would not want to hit a mountain lion with a slow slung Corvette. He'd slide right over the hood and through the windshield in my lap. That wouldn't be good. There are also a lot of skunks out here on the road this time of year, and this Corvette front end, shaped like a shovel, would scoop up one of those suckers real quick and glue them to the radiator grill, and that'd be a very nasty, smelly ride back to town. We don't want that. Absolutely not. Every time I come out here, the bar is already closed by the time I make it. Doggone it. If you know where this is, you win a prize. Well, that was a fun headlight test. I do have some comments about the performance and handling, but I'll save that for later on in the video. Let's go back to town and continue the review. And I'm hearing all kinds of strange noises coming up from the engine compartment. Probably cooling fans. Either that or they include a washer and driver for your 95 grand. The 
most of the air seems to be coming from this air duct. We also tested some other performance cars like the Charger Hellcat Wide Body Red Eye, the Durango Hellcat, two Supras, one red, one yellow, along with the Ram Hellcat. The Mercedes-Benz AMG 63S, which is about as fast as the Hellcat. And a new Lexus LC500 convertible. And these are real tests, not the phony tests you see on YouTube where they stand in the driveway and they go around the block a couple times. Like Demero and Ratty do. You don't need to watch them, you need to watch me. This is the convertible. We're going to show you the difference between that and the hardtop real quick. All you do is press a magic button and the top goes down in approximately 16 seconds. And by the way, I'm told this only adds 77 pounds to the weight of the car, so it's not a handicap. Here's another view. And here's one of the disadvantages of the convertible versus the coupe. On the coupe, you can look down and see the engine and press your buddies on here, that V8, hidden. No one will ever see it. Oh well. And here we are with the top totally folded. Now how does this compare to the hard top? Well on the hard top you have a removable roof panel. Looks something like this. You just lift it off and place it in the rear cargo hatch. Which now I'm using for something else since we don't need to put a roof in there. So the question of the day, why would you spend seven grand for a convertible when you can get the hardtop coupe and remove the roof panel and get pretty much the same effect? Well, different reasons for different people. Some people like the latest gadgetry, just like some people need the latest smartphone, but ah, you weren't listening, you're not supposed to have a smartphone. You need the cheap Walmart phone, remember? I think for a lot of people it's just more about convenience, being able to push a button to get the top down instead of lifting a panel. It makes Chevrolet happy because I don't think they're making any money off the base $60,000 Corvette. They're making money off options. And they're making some money off this. Here's the base price for the convertible. And of course, more options. More options. This one's loaded up with about everything. And there's your total tab. When it comes to quality control, Corvettes have never been known for their pride of workmanship and body panel fit. Although this one's pretty good, I must admit. Here on the inside, the convertible top lines up pretty good on the left side. Not so much on the right side, but hey, as long as it doesn't leak, who cares? And it hasn't leaked yet in the rain, so I'm not complaining. Let's take a peek in the cabin, and we actually do get a full-size glove box. Surprise! Apparently it can't be locked, so if you have the top down, you might want to take your valuables out and hide them somewhere else. I love push-button controls. So, got my wish. 17 here for the climate control. On the negative side, they all look alike, being the same color. you think they could have color-coded them, but I guess it wasn't in the budget, but I'm not complaining. Better than scrolling through an infotainment screen like some of the more expensive vehicles we get. I can live with this. And some people were complaining because the info screen and the climate control buttons are slanted towards the driver and the passenger can't see it. Well, so what? The passenger isn't driving and the passenger isn't paying for the car. So what are they bitching about? I want stuff pointed towards me. The 8-speed dual-clutch transmission is controlled by these push buttons. Unless you want to shift manually, then you hit this. And then go to the pedal shifters located on the steering wheel where they belong. Always be reached by your fingers. Far better than the Italians in Nissan who put them on the steering column where they can only be reached when driving a straight line. This push button control system is the best way to do a transmission shifter. It doesn't take up any room. You don't have to take your eyes off the road because you can feel exactly where you're at. And unless you're a total dunce, it's almost impossible to get the wrong gear. Far better system. I would like to see this on all cars. Although actually, this was invented back in the 1950s by Chrysler. People didn't like them, so they quit doing it. 
Yep, back in 1956, what kind of transmission shifter did Dodge have? The magic touch button. Ahead of their time. Well, I like it. It's a superior system, and I can see this on all cars. And that's the way I think, and I'm not changing my mind. Unless you give me a very good reason in the comment section. If you want to get out of the car, you have to press this electric button. And what happens if the battery goes dead while you're in it or shorts out? How do you get out? I don't know. If it happens, I guess I'll find out. All right, first half of the video is over, show and tell. Second half, we're going to go out and do some more driving. And the first thing you got to be concerned about is a slow front end, especially when you're going over speed bumps. But this has a solution for that. Anytime you come near a speed bump, you press this button. It raises the suspension so you don't get damage from the speed bump. And there's a GPS memory system that records this in the brain somewhere. So in the future, anytime you drive near that speed bump, the car will automatically raise and then lower once you pass it. Now this is an optional system. I don't know how the standard system works. I can only show you what I got. As we do in all my videos, we're going to take some mild speed humps around 20 miles per hour to evaluate the suspension performance and impact. And now that I program these speed bumps into the computer, the car should automatically raise itself. Well, we'll see. Very smooth. Bump number two. This is in the touring mode, by the way. Number three. And here comes the nasty one. Yeah, slightly felt it, but pretty comfortable. I'm very impressed. One thing I'm not as impressed about is all the reflections we get in the windshield. Here we have the blue panel, the HUD system hole. That's heads-up display, for those of you who don't know. Ventilation system reflecting. And driving at certain angles, we get other things we can't see, but might see later when we're on the highway. This isn't a deal breaker. It only happens at certain times of the day, at certain angles of the sun, but it is kind of annoying, and no one else on YouTube wants to show you this, because they're too scared. Might make somebody mad. We don't worry about that here. We do real testing. Now we turn the opposite direction and a lot of it's disappeared except for this little blue thing here. I think that's part of the carbon fiber package. Uh, I'll have to check that out. And by the way, Chevrolet did an excellent job on this power steering. Doesn't feel electric. Feels hydraulic like it should. I don't think anyone's going to be complaining. I'm not. So let's put the Magna Ride suspension in the track mode and see how the speed bumps do. Bump number one. Yeah, it seems a little firmer, I think. Let's try another one. Nothing overly dramatic. Now we got the big one coming up again. I would say slightly firmer, but nothing to worry about. I'm told this Corvette's faster than the Dodge Hellcat, and I've had three Hellcats this month, and in the touring mode, I got a 0 to 60 time of 3.6 seconds. Let's try the sport mode, and pardon the glare from the gauge cluster, but it's that time of day. Let's do it. The first one we got too much wheel spin was a 4.0, but my second run, 3.4, they beats any Hellcat I've driven thus far. Let's try the track mode. And track mode got a lot of wheel hop on the rear end, so 3.7. And the second in the track mode was a 3.5. According to the public relations people, the base Corvette should do 0 to 16 in around 3.3 seconds. If you have the Performance Z package, like I do, 2.8 seconds. And on a racetrack where the pavement is absolutely perfect, 
I have no doubt the Corvette can meet those times, but on the street or private roads, we have that low-grade asphalt. I don't think you're going to get those 0 to 60 times. I think 0 to 60 and 3.4 is certainly impressive, and I'm not complaining. And let's not forget the Chevrolet V8 engine originated, I think, around 1955, and even today with its considered antique pushrod technology, still outperforms many of the exotic dual cam 48 valve V8s out there. A very strong, excellent engine from Chevrolet. Still running, still going. After all these years. That's impressive too. So far we're getting 24.9 on the freeway. Let's take another trip. Pardon the glare, but it's the weather today. Can't do much about it. One thing I've noticed, certain angles of the day, certain angles of the sun, the housing for the heads-up display reflects in the windshield, as you see here. Not a deal killer, but it is kind of annoying. Especially since I turned off the heads-up display, so I wouldn't have to look at anything in my windshield, but that's just the way it is. Number two, even though this body is an aerodynamic design that cuts through the air pretty good, there's still a lot of wind noise, mainly due to the lack of insulation. That's a sports car, so I can live with it. And number three, the ride comfort is very nice for long trips, but I'm hearing a lot of rumbling noises coming up from the tires and suspension. Bottom line, this is a noisy car drowns out the radio on rough pavement, but again, it's a sports car, you're buying it for looks and performance, so it's not a big deal. I'm doing my best to keep my foot off the throttle, but with all these slow pokes I need to pass, I just can't help myself. It's going to kill the fuel economy figures, I can see that right now. If you keep the cruise control at 75 miles per hour, don't do any passing, you can get 27 in PG easy, but I couldn't help myself, had to do the passing. No point in having the power if you don't use it, so 24.4 is what we got thus far. Not bad. I'm going to take a break from the freeway driving to give you a heads up on freeway driving. One of the reasons this vehicle has such great aerodynamics is the low front end. That's the good news. The bad news is when you're on the freeway and all the rocks and big trucks hit your vehicle, they don't bounce off the radiator grill. Instead, they go right up over the hood and right onto the windshield. I've only had this vehicle two days. I took it out on the freeway today for two hours and I got hammered, hammered bad. There's rock number one. Ooh, that doesn't look good. Rock number two. And about a half a dozen other small ones that we can't see because of the glare. If you live back east where the environment is mainly dirt and trees, you shouldn't have too much of a problem. But if you live in the desert areas in the southwest, like New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, where there's a lot of gravel and rocks on the road and sand, your windshield is going to get hammered. You might want to get some windshield insurance. Here's a tip for you. Get some car wax, put a couple layers on the windshield, then buff it out. And it makes the surface a lot slicker and it can help against these impacts. Not foolproof, but especially on sand it works. Big rocks, not so much. Little tip for me to you. It works. We're going to drive down the nice curved roads by the Mexican border. sports cars and this car handles like a champ really sticks to the pavement this is pretty rough pavement that's making the tires create a bunch of droning noises but you'll get used to it after a while 
you get. It's a sports car, right? So who cares? And nothing beats the nice roar of a good small block Chevy V8 running hard. Worth the price of admission alone. So far I've been driving with the top up. Now it's time to put it away and do some open air driving. Even though it's 40 degrees and I'm freezing my <clears throat> off. Okay, we're doing open top driving, see? And yeah, there's a lot of wind noise going around. It's not a quiet one, but yeah, why complain? Again, it's a sports car. You want wind in your hair. Let's do it. If you're driving in cold weather like I am, you don't have to worry too much because this heater blows lots of hot air and these heated seats warm your buns real good. Oh, and I forgot the heated steering wheel as well. I'm nice, toasty, warm, not an issue. This is what driving a roadster is all about. Hitting the gas throttle and having the wind in your air. Having the healthy roar of that V8 engine makes it even better. I think this Corvette's too wide to fit in my driveway. Getting the paint scratched. Home sweet home. Our goal was to put 600 miles on the clock and turn the car back in, but uh, as you see, we're racking up a lot more because this is fun to drive. We don't want to stop. We over the thousand mark by this evening. And for those interested, the fuel economy 19.6 average. Pretty good for a nice performance car. I'm not complaining at all. So that's my take on this Corvette after a week of driving. Well, they wanted to make a car just as good looking as the European Exotics. They wanted to make a car that performs like the European Exotics. And they wanted to do it around one third the price and they succeeded on all three counts. I say total thumbs up from my standpoint. Plus it'd be serviced by over 5,000 GM dealers in North America. And has one of the sweetest engines on the planet. A nice, nice ride. Hate to give it back. Here are some links to other high performance cars we've driven lately. Just click and watch and subscribe. I need the gas money. Might spend a little bit on beer too.